Great. Well, welcome back. Uh, welcome back for our final session, the, the, the home run. Um, next on stage, we have Ernest Edmonds. Um, he's described uh, in, in, in the leaflet as a constructivist artist, which apparently is that you construct what you see rather than what's really there. Um, and it comes from abstract art. Um, fascinating stuff. Uh, Ernest has been uh, using computers to create art since 1968 uh, and first started showing his interactive work in 1970. Uh, PhD in logic at Nottingham University, professor of computational art at De Montfort University in Leicester, and professor of computational and creative media at the University of Technology in Sydney. So many strings to his bow. He's exhibited from Moscow to LA and much in between. He's a, a true pioneer of computer art. Let's welcome Ernest. Uh, so you might not have noticed, but it was very good that I was described on the screen just now as Ernest Edmonds with an A. I am Ernest. I'm Ernest by name and Ernest by nature, as you will discover. Uh, okay, so I'm talking about uh, the art of interaction. Um, I was hoping to be introduced like the first speaker, as up and coming young and all that, but no, I wasn't, but never mind. Um, I'm going to talk about art interaction and the active audience. I'm not talking about what's going on today, and I'm afraid, I apologise to the organisers, I'm not looking at the horizon. I'm looking beyond the horizon. That's what art does. Art is a kind of probe into the future, looking at what might be. Um, and, well, I'm going to start by saying a few things about the past and then move on to the future. Um, I'm, as our uh, host just explained, I started working in this field a long time ago and I talked about interaction and how computers would be important creatively and in art uh, in terms of their interaction back in, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, produced various models of how that worked. And I want to just give a few notes about a bit of history of work in this area, research into interaction in the computer. Of course, every game has in it at least one computer, usually more than one today. Um, we started back in 1947 uh, with talk about computers needing to be easy to use. That was quite interesting in 1947. That was way before anyone thought of it, the personal computer, let alone made one. But even then, this easy to use was was there. And then, in a way, this is the beginning of computer games, really, and the notion of engagement. And this was uh, first talked about in 1982. And I want to say things about engagement. I'm not interested in designing games. I'm interested in enabling experience. So I want to, my interest is not in the game, not in the bit of technology, not in what it does. My interest in, is in what the people using it experience. All right? And I suggest to you that that's what we should all be concentrating on. Because the game itself is only an enabler of human experience. And this is a, a thought that's been going back um, since uh, 1982 at least. Um, and of course encouraging creativity, and concentrating on the experience. So I'm just going to give you a quick progress report on a new vocabulary for interaction in the context of the kind of work that we're all concerned with here today. Um, most of this um, was done in my research group. I have two research groups, as uh, you've just heard, and I'm, I'm kind of commuting. Uh, I'm on my way to this, to, to this one at the moment. Uh, uh, this is one of our research group meetings, which we took, took place on a yacht in Sydney Harbour and took this picture while we were having a, doing our work. Um, and it's quite good, actually. Uh, and I have to say that maybe there are a sense, there's a sense in which working in Sydney has some advantages over working in Leicester or even, even Newcastle, probably. Um, OK, so I'm going to give you now two examples of the kind of uh, work that... Uh, I'm involved in and that my compatriots are involved in, in terms of trying to understand the experience that we're talking about. Bridget Costello um, has 
uh, worked with me. She'd done research, she did a PhD. That probably doesn't interest you in detail, but that's the kind of stuff we do. Um, working on art as play. Now, this isn't a game. This is above the level of game. Like game is one example of, of interaction as play. And she's, she's taken on the notions that we're used to in the game uh, arena and looks at them in terms of how they can be made to be effective. And here's a little video of her talking about her work. It's better that she talks about it. This work was created whilst I was on exchange in Japan working with um, Dr. Kazushi Nishimoto who um, is affiliated with CCS. He works at the Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in Kanazawa. Sprung was created in response to an earlier work called Elysian Fields. That work was using a floor pad system and had an animated abstract field of grass. And one thing I noticed as people walked around it was that they tended to stomp their feet even though the, the amount of pressure that they were putting on the pads didn't actually affect the work at all. I was kind of interested about the way that the representation of the grass being stomped affected the behaviour of the participants. And so I designed this work with springs to see if I could get people to use this, using the same floor pads to actually jump and spring about instead of doing that kind of stomping behaviour. Both of these works then led me on to develop my central research question, which is looking at the relationship between um, the types of gestural interactions that people might do within an interactive work, and then the ways that those gestural interactions are represented within the actual work, and how I can design those two elements so as to stimulate people to actually play creatively. The methodology I'm using is, this is a practice-based art research project. I'm creating a series of various artworks. I also see the stimulation of creative... So, um, what came out of this was an understanding that the experience that people have in playing with something like an artwork or a game or whatever is actually much more complex and much more varied than we often realise. And uh, here's a list of the kind of different categories of, of experience that people might have. They might have a creative experience, they might have an experience of difficulty, complexity, struggling with something, danger maybe, um, and so on and so forth. And the point is that when designing this interactive experience, we have to have in mind what kind of experience we're going for. And, the, and that the, the interactive design of the system will be different depending on which kind of experience we want to enable, to encourage and so on. So, so Bridget uh, has in her work lots of examples of how you can design for different purposes in terms of this kind of experience. Um, and I'll give you an, another example. This is um, Andrew Johnston who, who started life as a musician. musician. He played in orchestras in Australia. Uh, the trombone, and he'll explain something about what he's been doing. In my PhD, I'm examining the development of interactive software for musicians. And the basic research question is, um, can using computers to visualise and transform musical performance enhance performers' understanding of their playing and encourage creative exploration? So what you can do as a musician is improvise with this toy in a way that the, that the toy sort of becomes an extension of the instrument. Um, and as well as that, you can use the toy to perhaps highlight aspects of your playing that you weren't aware of just by listening. For example, slurs. If I play two notes, um, a D and an A for example, and I try and slur smoothly between them, 
you should ideally see two spheres, the D sphere move out and then the A sphere move out as I do the slur. If I don't do it smoothly, you'll see more than two. So you can see there that in addition to the D and the A sphere, the E flat sphere also uh, moved, which meant that my slur wasn't that clean. I actually caught a bit of the E flat on the way up to the A. I'll try and do a smooth one now. method that I'm using in this PhD is a, a really a type of action research um, and that initially uh, I'm looking at the literature particularly in the areas of human computer interaction. Okay so uh, Andrew has been working on how people play in an another dimension and he's found uh, by studying and interviewing people and so on that they can use this interactive experience in different ways. He calls them instrumental, ornamental and conversational. Instrumental means they control it. Basically, you do this and, you know, you learn how to control it. Ornamental means that basically the system is kind of ornamenting, adding to whatever you're, you're doing. And conversational means that what you do, as a musician in his case, is influenced by what the system does. So there's there an exchange and a creative exchange uh, that is really uh, most interesting in that respect. Okay, now I'm going to... Uh, skip a couple there because I want to get to this one because there's another important point that's come out of all of this work. We've done loads of work uh, in public places, in, in especially in, in the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, Australia. And here's something that uh, no one has mentioned yet but is really important, is that when you interact with something, when you play a game, the way you do it, what you experience changes over time. Okay? So that if, you, if you play a game for a lot of time, for weeks or months, and hopefully you do, uh, then two months later you're playing it differently, you're experiencing different things, uh, and you're wanting different things out of it to what you did to start with. So in designing uh, an interactive experience such as a game, or an artwork that's interactive, you have to take into account that the interactive experience is something that will develop over time. And so although I said earlier on, you know, you need to decide, do you want it to in, you know, give a sort of experience of danger or fun or whatever it is, you also have got to think about what sort of experience do you want to start with, what experience do you want as you get on, and what experience do you want in the long term? Okay. So it has to, the experience evolves, and the system has to enable that evolution of experience to retain interest. If it doesn't, then you'll throw it away and buy the next one. Okay. Um, and, okay, and so this is a model that we built about how it all evolved. Um, and you can read about it if you want to. Um, we don't play games just on tablets, so of course, and stuff, and interactive stuff. We do big stuff. So this is uh, an interactive work in, in Federation uh, Square in Melbourne. Uh, on a big screen, uh, people are talking in the square and as they talk this work changes and they're interacting with it and so on. And here's another work in, which in the street in Sydney, so big screens, big interaction and the interaction isn't necessarily through touching keys or you know doing things, it might just be in my moving. So a lot of my work for example uses cameras and it's just how you walk and that's the interactive uh, in input. Um, and also, a lot of it is distributed. So here's an example of a work uh, I did which was uh, between Belfast and Sydney. So one bit of it was in Belfast and one bit in Sydney. And um, in Sydney, people were interacting with, some, with this thing. And um, seeing pictures of Belfast, and in Belfast, people were interacting with it and seeing pictures of Sydney, and they were actually interacting with one another. So people were interacting with a one work, which was interacting itself with another work, which was interacting with more people. So people were interacting with one another across the internet in that kind of way. Not playing the same game. So when you say people play the same game, you imagine there's one game. Here I'm talking about many games. And the games themselves interacting with one another. I showed a work in Paris last week 
where, we, where this is so, and we have a, an open system so people can build new games or new interactive artworks or whatever that can interact with the existing set of works. So now you have the, the games or the interactive artworks interacting with one another as well as with people. Uh, and also, this is the kind of work uh, that, that I do which changes over long periods of time. So it's not necessarily action response, which is like the typical game model, but the game of life is a much longer game. You know, we do things and we expect to have um, things happening over a much longer period of time than the few seconds or the few minutes that we're interacting with it. And the way I often say this um, is I have grandchildren now and I play with my grandchildren. And of course, I love the fact that they respond when I play with them. But I'm also hoping that 10 years' time they'll be slightly better people because I've had a good game with them now. Uh, so I call this influence. So influencing as well as interacting. Okay. And that game, the real life games, are played over one's life, not over half an hour or an hour or two. Uh, and I think we need to take that into account also. And of course you can combine all these things, so here's some stuff I've been doing uh, in the street, this is in Adelaide in Australia, uh, where you're connecting different parts of the city. So you start to play games in the interactive city. Today, more and more cities are, in, are connected. The light, we don't really realise it, but the lighting system of a city, city is all on a computer, actually. It's networked. We could do all kinds of stuff with it that we don't yet do. The city is networked already, and the opportunity to use the network city as a vehicle for making these interactive experiences and for doing something, I don't think the word game applies anymore, but something like that, uh, uh, is there. And that's the future, I think. Okay, the interactive city. Um, and in order to talk about this, we need a language. And that's what I'm getting to. And here we are. This is kind of my last real slide, which I'm not going to read through. But here's some of the words that we should be using Okay, it's not about rendering and, you know, objects and widgets and stuff. That's, that's just how we do it. What it's really about is uh, learning, anticipation, suspense, difficulty and all these things. These are the words that we should be using. And if you want to know what I've been really up to, uh, you can look on my website or, you, or even better, buy the book. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Great. Well, we have a couple of minutes for a, a question or two. If anybody's had, uh, if anyone's got any? No? Well, I, I, I'd, I'd like to kick off, if I may, right. and then we'll, we'll see. Okay. Um, you, you, you talk about what's going on in your book. You Very, very interesting talking about what you've done. Can you just talk a little bit about what you're planning to do, or would that give away? Sure, sure. No, 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 I don't mind telling you what I'm doing now. Um, so now, um, what I'm now doing is is building interactive artworks that are open, so they're open systems. I've been working with systems all along. In fact, that very first paper that I put up a slide of, uh, which was in Ready 1970, talked about the systems view of interaction. And the new open thing is to, I'm, I'm making artworks. That I showed a first version of it in Paris last week. Uh, where the, the artwork is interactive. It's actually interactive not with keys and stuff, but with cameras and microphones and so on. So the input is through movement and sound and so on. Um, but the artwork sits on the internet. And, that, and there's an open call. In fact, I wrote an email to someone in Australia this morning to say, when I'm showing this work in Sydney, would you like to make another artwork that interacts across the internet with my artwork? And I've already got one that's doing it. So we'll have a set of works. I'm not controlling it. All I'm setting is the API. Okay? And I'm saying, OK, you do whatever you want. You make your own interactive artwork, whatever you want, and let it interact with my artwork. It'll tell my artwork what you're doing, and my artwork will tell you what it's doing, and you do whatever you want to do with that information. And I'll do whatever I want to do with that information. Okay? And the plan is to have it, the, the next version, which will be in Sydney in June. Uh, there will be, I hope, three artworks working across the internet. They, 
Uh, one of them will be in a fixed place. That's my central piece. Uh, the, the guy I wrote to this morning, I hope, will do his in a fixed place. The third person will run on iPhones and, I, and, and iPads, and so it could be anywhere. Okay. So now we have this, uh, this whole idea of interaction and interactive systems okay, where the systems themselves are interacting with one another. They're mediating, if you like, our interaction with them. It's completely open and uh, uh, not in any way controlled. So we're moving away from the idea of designing the whole thing. We're designing a structure. That's all. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. Thank you.